In late 2014, when the S550 Mustangs first showed up, it was a completely different car. Now, before I'd worked on all kinds of other cars, all the way up until the S197s, but the S550 was a different chassis. There were a lot of challenges in doing videos. One such video was the Eibach Sportline Springs. Eibach was the first one to make a spring for that chassis, and they sent us a set to do a video on, well, we didn't know how to do it. So we basically set up the cameras and made a video and learned as we went. This video, yeah, was early December 2014. At the time, we only we had a Rico Boost. That was the first one we got. I had ordered my GT. It wasn't in yet. We ordered a black GT. It wasn't in yet. But we got our hands on our Rico Boost. And actually, it wasn't even the one we ordered. The dealers happened to get a similar one and let us take it. Wheels. We actually haven't showed you these yet because as soon as we put the wheels on the car, it made our next mod painfully obvious. Our EcoBoost definitely needed an attitude adjustment as far as... So we got that car and we had a set of wheels because wheel fitment was pretty much the same from S197. We put wheels on it and it looked ridiculous. So like I said, you know, we'd reached out to all the companies like, hey, who's got springs coming for these cars? Well, Ibox being, you know, the big company that they are, they're like, oh yeah, well, we have a set of springs readily. We a set coming, I think it was like, they told us like a week out and they sent us the very, very first set of springs for the S550. And we all knew that car, you know, when I saw the S550, the first time I loved it. I wanted one the day I saw it. I love the look of it. I love the style. Couldn't wait to get one. And I knew, like any other Mustang, they set the wheels and lower it. Gonna completely, completely change the car. So that's what we were excited about. Like I said, we'd already put wheels on this car. We had a set of niche wheels, and uh, we got the springs and didn't know how to install them. So it was kind of like you know, it was an IRS car, and I worked on the 0304 Cobra, but the S550 was you know, it's a different chassis, completely different car. So it's funny, we started, you know, we got the springs. We started with the front because the front's pretty much basically the same as other. It's a normal strut style setup. It wasn't too difficult to do. It was the back where we were really kind of not sure what we we're going to do. Yeah, the 20s looked silly on there with, uh, with stock springs for sure. I think the car... I think it had like 46 miles on it at this point. I mean, it, it was brand new. I said, this was the first one we got. I had ordered my blue car. We ordered a black one. Neither one had come in yet. We'll start by removing the pieces off the strut itself we need to remove. First one being the sway bar. I'm gonna hold the end link from the back. That was funny too, when I was doing this, I remember looking at the hub and seeing it was blind. And it's like, I'd never seen that on previous models before. And me having to start thinking, it's like, hey, are they gonna make an all wheel drive Mustang? I mean, it, it could be a possibility. This is back in 2014. Now, of course, we learned later that that hub was used on different models. And they used it, I think on the Explorer and some different things. It was never meant to be for, never meant to be all wheel drive, but it was definitely one of those things that, you know, when we first got this car, it was just so cool to dive into this and start taking it apart because every time we worked on it, it was like, you know, we'd see something new that we hadn't noticed before. To be able to remove the nut and bolt that hold the spindle to the strut, you have to remove the brake caliper to get to these nuts back here. One bolt at the bottom, one bolt at the top. That's funny. I've, I've probably installed uh, 30, 40 sets of these since then. And it's like I know every bolt by size. I know exactly where to go. But like I said, this, this was cool because it was a brand new car. And they're always kind of fun to take apart. You see what you're going to find. We're going to take the rotor off as well just because it's kind of in the way. We'll start separating the spindle from the strut. Now, this is a challenging part. A lot of people who comment on these videos, this is the part that really gets them is how to get these bolts out because you basically have to loosen the nut and then you got a hammer on them. And I've had some cars couple taps with a hammer and they pop right through. Other ones I've swung as hard as I can and it takes 10, 15, 20 good swings before they go through. And it just seems like it depends on the car. There, there seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. These, if you look, I mean, this is real time. They went through pretty quick. The convertible we did, we literally had to stop shooting and go back and shoot again because I was hammering those things so hard and they would not come out. These came out fairly easy, which made me think every S550 would be easy and people would comment on it and tell me the kind of problems they were having. And I'm just like, mine came right out, which in this video they actually did. But again, cars in the future, I'm like, okay, I feel your pain. I know exactly what you're talking about. To 
remove the spring from the strut assembly, we have to remove the nut up here and then the strut mount itself. To do that though, you want to compress the spring first. Don't try to remove this. Something we get asked in a lot of videos too, including this one, is about the tools that we use, where we get things from. Uh, this was an ATC, ATC or ATD, one or the other. Spring compressor that we got that works great for now this kind of application. Nut from the top of the strut mount, take the strut mount off, and then decompress the spring. Oh. IBOC includes a new bump stop as well as new dust boots to work. So we talked about how mistakes happen. Well, this was another one. We were doing this, and brain fart on my fault. I put the bump stop in upside down. And we never had a problem, it never caused any issues, it didn't, it, you know, it never bottomed out, we didn't really have any problems with it, but yeah, it's something that I, I screwed up. <laughs> I, put it, I put it on upside down, I think it was one of those where we're just so excited to be working, you know, being the first to install these springs on this brand new car that I just made a rookie mistake and put it on upside down. the new bump stop and dust boot in the place on the strut. If we swing down to the comments, you know, we got a couple hundred comments on this video. Make sure many, many people pointed it out like, great video, you put this upside down, look at the other CJ videos, he installed it the right way the next time, which is true. It just happened to be a mistake that I made. Our assembly is ready to go back in the car. Now we'll put the strut assembly back. Spring compressor gets in the way, it's like, uh, we need it. There's really nothing I can do about that. Make sure the ABS line Thank you for the high quality videos, you know, you're welcome. I said we love you guys when you make a, we love reading these comments, stuff like that. I'm missing my boot, what do I do? People ask about what do you recommend for camber caster plates, or do you need a camber, should I get camber bolts or camber caster plates or both? Um, it depends on the car, it depends on the kind of adjustment you want. I'm a big fan of the Maximum Motorsports caster camber plates because they give you all kinds of adjustment. If you're lower in the car, more for looks, a set of camber bolts will get you within specs so you don't wear your tires unevenly. So the bolts are fine for something like that, but if you want if you do want a performance alignment where you might go with a little bit more negative camber for handling purposes, the, the plates will be a lot nicer to have because you get the adjustability the out of it. Do you need plates for alignment? Usually on the sport lines, they're low enough that you'll be on the edge of the factory yeah, alignment. Right. I know some people have said they've been able to align it without bolts. A lot of people have said they did need the bolts on like a Pro Kit or a CJSL Tech Springs, you'd be fine. But the lower you get, the more likely you are to need camber bolts to get it within spec. And then reinstall your end light. Much better install video than your competitors. Thanks for the info. <laughs> we like that. They're always Step good comments. I'll take those. Nuts on the strut tower. And it's fun. You know, I love going back and looking at this video. I mean, like I said, this video we put up in 2014, and I see some of these names in the comments that I still see regularly today, which is great. I mean, I love the fact you know, that you guys not only like found us that long ago, but have actually stuck around all these years and still watch what we do. The car one side at a time. Before you do that, what wheels, what size wheels, what wheels. A lot of people ask about the wheels on that car. They were niche wheels. I can't remember what the style was of them, but they were a cool looking wheel. What the name of the model was. The bump stop is inside the rear shocks. We have to replace that as part of the installation. We also remove these two How low, how low, how low. It's like, yeah, well, it definitely gets it low. At the time, we really didn't know because, like I said, when we got these springs from Eibach, they came in a white box. There was no instructions, no torque specs. There was nothing. This was so early in the S550 development that we didn't even know how low it was going to get. We were guessing an inch and a half to two inches, but we really didn't even know at the time. And then remove that nut. But yeah, here was the challenging part was definitely the rear suspension because we, again, we didn't know how to do it. Like, you, we could see where the spring was, you could see how the subframe held it in place, but we kind of just guessed. Like, I looked at the suspension, this figured, okay, I can let this stop. down. I should be able to get it we out, but we didn't know if it was gonna throw the cradle the off. Bump down we didn't know if there'd be enough room to get it out. The new bump stop no, it, was, it, was, it was challenging, for sure. Quite a bit smaller than the one on the factory. I'll never forget, back at the time, whatever, my boss used to approve all the videos. He wanted to see what we were doing, and we were still kind of new at this at that point. We did this video and I sent it to him and I remember, I remember his comment very specifically going, yeah, that'll do till somebody figures out an easier way to do it. Because the rear is kind of a pain. They're not hard, they're just kind of a pain. And it's funny, you know, that yes, 550 has been out for how many years now? Yeah, going on six years now. And nope, this is, this is still become, this is still the way everybody does it. Because 
there is no easier way. You, you have to let the subframe down, you have to loosen it up, and that's literally the only way you're gonna get it apart. And I still suggest, people have asked me, you know, you lower the whole subframe down at the same time. The reason I do one side at a time is so you don't lose alignment of that subframe. Uh, you know, we carry the Steeda kits that actually align it to make it so it doesn't move, which is a great thing to have. But if you take it all down at the same time and put it back up, more than likely your subframe is going to have to be moved around when you have an alignment done, which will be a process for whoever's doing your alignment and probably end up being a more expensive alignment. And then reinstall the cap. So one side at a time is still the way I recommend it. Disconnected, go underneath the car, remove the subframe bolt so we can lower it down to install the spring. We'll start by supporting the subframe, use a pole jack or a jack. And when we did this, I, I did consider it. I looked at it and it's like, wow, I can remove all four bolts and then move it down evenly. But then I thought about the subframe, what at that point is gonna move, because there was no way we're gonna get it right back where it was. Even if we marked it, we wouldn't get it right back where it was. And just loosen them up. So we decided to do it this way. And I said it, it, it did work and uh, to this day is still the way to do it. Now we can take out the subframe. Like every bolt's brand new. Like, <laughs> there's so much fun to work on when they're stock and untouched. Now you can slowly remove the rear, making sure the subframe Even the factory secure. exhaust on this car still. Now we'll go back to our pole jack and lower down the subframe. Basically get it down to the point where it gets loose and you want to pull down on it a little bit. Now you want to sort of pull down on the control arm and pull the spring out of the upper perch. Yeah, I used to try to take the spring out through the rear, but definitely found the front the is easier again, to go. Same as the front, the eye box a couple upward. times pulling them out of that perch, I definitely caught my finger on the sway bar too and put it up into place. You want to put it in from the top, same way you took it out. Yeah, the new springs are a lot easier to put in because they're shorter. Literally just spin it till it sits in the lower control arm and push it up into place, and it's pretty straightforward to do. The control arm has a preset stop for your bottom of your coil spring. But make sure the factory insulator is up against it. When you put the spring in place, you want to turn it until it's touching there. Once you do that, you lift the subframe back into place. I'm gonna put the bolts up in the place for the subframe. Just get them started by hand and make sure they go in straight. I always suggest to this day still start those bolts by hand. I've seen people cross thread them and try to hit them with an impact gun when they're not threaded properly and snap the bolt off inside the subframe, which makes for a very expensive repair. Because then you have to drop the whole subframe and then drill out the frame. So definitely they will turn easily by hand. Always make it a few turns by hand before you hit with any kind of an impact gun. Reinstall the ABS line in the clip and reconnect the brake line. Last step, push the shock down into place. There's actually two. This is actually the only S550 CJ car that I don't know what happened to. It, it got traded in at one point. Might have been for our Focus Repeat RS, if I remember. But I, yeah, this one I don't know where it ended up. Went to a dealer and it got sold and I don't know where it was. It was always a cool looking car though with the graphics and the wheels and the, the drop. It was definitely a cool car, but yeah, this, you know, it's always exciting when you're working on a new car. I mean, the S550 just came out. We knew it was going to be a huge hit for Ford. Yeah, you know, we were just learning these cars back then. I mean, so much has happened now since then. We've done superchargers and all kinds of other stuff, but yeah, you know, this was like really the first technical installation on the S550, and uh, it was just a cool video to do. The Eibach Sportline springs combined with our new niche wheels gives our EcoBoost the perfect stance. The installation on these will probably take you between two and three hours, so you'll be back on the road in no time. For more installation videos for your 2015 Mustang, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel.